Hi everyone. Hi, I'm going to interrupt your wonderful conversation. Hi everyone. My. Hi. How are you? Good, good. Hey everybody. Um, I'm so sorry. Everyone's having a good time, and I feel really bad for interrupting you. But um, we have this program planned, which is going to be very brief. <laughs> it's just going to be a little bit of talking. Can you guys come up? We want to celebrate the Outlook uh, exhibit here. And it's in this room. <laughs> yeah, grab your cocktail. Uh, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, I'm really excited to have everyone here tonight at the museum. Um, we're coming up on seven years in this space which is pretty exciting. And the Historical Society is now 43, so if you add that together, we're at our 40th anniversary. I'm very excited. Oh, 40 years. Whatever. Anyway. 50 is a big deal. I'm not I get into trouble by first seeing Daisy. Um, my name is Terry Beswick, and I'm the uh, Executive Director of the Historical Society. Um, I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, it's such a wonderful organization to work with, and we do so uh, so many so many amazing uh, rich projects. Um, the only problem is that we have too many ideas um, and too many projects to do. Uh, and even in my conversations here tonight, I had several <laughs> new ideas, um, which are great. I mean, you know, it means that we can go and write some grant proposals together and write some projects and go and try to get some donations in so that we can do them. So I just want to make, before I introduce EG, I just want to um, make a brief pitch for the Historical Society memberships. You know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but um, how many people actually have a membership to the Historical Society? I just got mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you and welcome. Uh, you are all treasures and you're the lifeblood that keeps the organization going um, and makes it possible for us to do exhibits like this and um, to have our wonderful archives. How many people have been to the archives downtown? Yay! Well, if you haven't, please do uh, give us a call, make an appointment, and come down and do some research. And, uh, and, if, uh, and if there's something that you're looking for that's not in the archives, then go find it and donate it to us. <laughs> because we're still collecting and we have space. Um, and so we're very proud of our organization because we are, we are the repository for our culture and our history, um, particularly in Northern California, but really, really worldwide, we're the, one of the largest archives. And uh, we're on a forward trajectory, I'm very excited that we're going to be hiring a couple new additional staff this year. Um, well, I think we're going to be up to seven staff people wow. on full time. So that's pretty cool. And that's also made possible by uh, your memberships and, um, and also some city funding. But, uh, uh, and a bequest. Um, actually, we got a large bequest uh, from uh, John DiCecco, who is the former uh, editor of the Journal of Homosexuality at San Francisco State University. Um, and he unfortunately recently passed away, but fortunately he had the foresight to think about the historical society as well. And so we got a significant uh, bequest. Um, we're going to be actually renaming the archives in his honor. And it made it possible for us to do some expansion. And we're not expanding for the sake of expanding. We're expanding because uh, there is an increasing demand for our work. Um, I think uh, particularly when we look at what's going on in the economy and with the, with the culture in San Francisco and there's so much displacement and so many things are being lost, not just our stuff but our places um, and our memories. And so I think now in particular it's very important for us to collect those things. Um, we are such a diverse community and, uh, and we have so many stories to tell. And that's why we're expanding. Um, and, uh, and I think it's an important part of the resistance movement. And, uh, and, and I'm becoming increasingly aware of that as, as we see what's going on um, with the country. So, so please do join us if you haven't already, um, and, or, or donate in some other way, or volunteer. Um, 
Now, the Outlook exhibit, I think, is something I'm very proud of. It was one of the first uh, grant proposals that I worked on in this, in this job with AG, uh, with the Creative Work Fund. And, uh, and I'm, I'm particularly proud of it because of the huge, uh, how many people here are collaborators on this project or contributed in some way to the Outlook? <laughs> hi, hi. Um, well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and please stay involved. Um, if, you, if you were involved in Outlook Managing or in this exhibit in collaborating uh, in some way, in creating the art pieces here, please, uh, there are several working groups that we have with the Historical Society and a couple of projects I'd love to talk to you about after I'm done talking, or after EG's done. Um, so please uh, come up and I can tell you about those um, because uh, we have a lot of work to do. So, um, so the Outlook exhibit, everybody knows it's one of the seminal, it was one of the seminal uh, queer theory publications in the world. And uh, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful that we're able to bring it to life again and with the publication. It's really one of the first, I think the first major publication from the Historical Society. The new, what is it, issue number 18 of Outlook. And so if you don't have a copy, pick one up. They're discounted tonight, I believe. And uh, you know, they're a great stocking stuffer. <laughs> Christmas gum. Um, <laughs> uh, fourth thing, um, there you go. I'm going to say that. Um, and so, um, so I just want to introduce E.G. Crichton and say thank you to E.G. Uh, for this wonderful project, which is so much more than what you see here. It's got an online life. It will continue. There are further publications that are emerging that E.G. can tell you about. Um, and of course, um, uh, this exhibit itself, which I think is a wonderful contribution to the culture of San Francisco. So thank you so much for your work on this. And keep it going. participants that did the work that you see in the magazine and on the walls here. So first of all, could all the people who worked on it come up? Gerard, Terry, Ramon, Jeffrey, um, um, Ariel, um, who else is here? Ramon, come up. Elizabeth, you're hiding. Jeff. Jeffrey, come on. Come on. No, I mean like up. Oh, <laughs> Becky Shy, come on. Uh, Jeremy, where the hell are you? <laughs> Terry. Terry, you have to come back. <laughs> no, no, that's a separate thing. <laughs> First, first, the people who made the, I mean, really, this was a huge collaboration. And I uh, am really grateful to how enthusiastic people were on working on it and how well it, I mean, it really went smoothly. So Elizabeth and Jeremy were the exhibition organizers, um, really um, designers. Um, I can't thank you enough. I mean, you really made this happen. So thank you so much. Um, nobody would be here if it weren't for Gerard. He, he was like our communications director who really <laughs> constantly put this out on social media in a really good way. Um, and then the look of it is partly because of uh, Jeffrey and Ramon and Jeffrey's business Creatus, who designed like this wall. So you know, I handed him I handed him the, the Photoshop document, which was like 15 gigabytes, and he produced this wallpaper, and then also the Outlook and printer, he did a lot of the printing, and Ramon um, helped with the, both design and hanging of everything. Um, Terry, you already know, we have actually a special guest that I didn't expect to meet, who I have an email relationship with, Ariel, who um, is from, is came here from 
York is visiting and just graduated from Pace. Oh, As her reward for graduation, she gets she got to come here and visit. And Ariel, the reason we had an email relationship was because um, I worked with Stephanie Shu, who's a professor at Pace and was one of Ariel's professors. Um, on the CLAGS was one of the participants, you know, one of the, instead of an individual person, uh, an actual organization that I asked to create something. And so that mainstreams of queer studies is what came out of CLAGS, and Ariel is the designer. So, um, and people always ask, how can I get that chart? And um, if you buy a magazine at the discounted rate, Tonight it has the chart in the back, so yeah, so you can actually you know look Scan at it, it. Up close. And two people have not come, neglected to come up here, Maya and Don. Come on. <laughs> oh come on. Come on, come on. So Maya and Don, I invited them, and they. I'm so glad that they agreed to do it at such a high rate of pay. <laughs> um, uh, are the editors of the magazine. They're, the, they're really the two people who curated. You know, I, I sent like a, a really a lot of work their way and they went through it and figured out how to craft that into a magazine, which is no easy task. It involved editing everybody's work, deciding what's really works well in a magazine, what's important, um, and then endless copy editing. <laughs> So, is there, uh, who else? Oh, uh, 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 Demetrius, are you here still? Yeah. Come here. <laughs> um, and Powie's not here, right? Um, okay. Oh, uh, Valeria, where are you? She just left. Oh, one of the exhibition designers. Um, so, Demetrius was my tech man, uh, really um, celebra. I mean, uh, had to wrangle, this was a high maintenance show, and had to wrangle with, you know, I had like ideas, but had no clue how to actually make them work, like the interactive survey, which shows up on the video wall. Well, we didn't even have a video wall before Demetrius figured out how to get one and how to deal with it. So thank you, Demetrius. Um, so, and then there's a million other people, you know, um, uh, I, I was one of the uh, six founders of Outlook, and one of the other founders, Jeffrey Escoffier, worked with me from New York and has done things in New York related to this, including suggesting um, people, and he had a relationship with Clags and with Stephanie Shu and other ways that he and I would regularly consult about this. Um, and likewise, Robin Stevens was an editor of Outlook, and she helped with um, a lot of things like the website. Um, and I'd also like to, to do a little um, shout out, I guess that's not the appropriate word, but Deborah Chasnoff what just died, like right as she was able to come to the opening on October 6th and died shortly after that. She was one of the founders of Outlook. And, um, I was really happy that she could come to the opening. She was thrilled. So, um, all right. Thank you for coming up. Now I want to bring up the people who were, you know, the process for this project. Yeah, get them around. I don't know if people um, know exactly what the process was, but briefly, there were 17 issues of Outlook, and I invited. Um, and the selection process was through word of mouth, through people I knew, other people suggested people. Um, each each per, of 38 participants received a physical copy of Outlook. And what I asked them to do was to respond in some way to something in that issue and to create a brand new work. And these people are writers, poets, uh, visual artists, uh, video artists, choreographers, I mean, really a wide range of creative production. So could you guys come up? Jackie, Elena, Raphael, um, <laughs> uh, Anybody else here who is a participant? Anybody else who is a participant? So, um, uh, and you're, 
give back from uh, Arizona, right? Yeah. We get the short trip. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So these are just a, a small grouping of the people that were very generously participated. Um, do you want to say, Elena wrote an article, a wonderful essay, where she read about outright, the first outright. <laughs> she responded to the first outright conference, which was talked about in the issue that I, I sent you. And um, really um, kind of imagined being there and wrote an essay that really addressed it um, from the point of view of now and both what was timely and what wasn't. Um, so buy the magazine to, to see that. Julian created the zine that we only have like one copy left of. <laughs> oh, <that's amazing. laughs> They're really, really wonderful, wonderful <laughs> zine. And he also created Act Up Like stickers that it's also were queer nation. I mean, queer nation like nation. stickers. Yes. That, that so maybe 800 of them and there's one. Wow. wow. Save it for the archives. I know. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I very carefully <laughs> sort of. Um, um, distributed, you know, tried to control the distribution so that they would last. Mm -hmm. So, and, um, Lapis. Lapis. <laughs> Tell me what you, what you did. Um, uh, Raphael and I worked on interpreting the issue of that book, uh, regarding an uh, exhibition of uh, Kiss and Tell. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I yeah. I didn't. I, I haven't met you. I didn't realize that. Was <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Actually, and, and a wonderful piece, which is right over there, that um, not only recreates this art event that was written about in Outlook, but invites interaction. And every single page is chock full of comments. Um, so nice to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that um, sort of idea came to me, um, thinking about archives and thinking about how messy they should be and ought to be and how to pretend to be perfect and organized and how we can insert ourselves into them. Mm -hmm. And the mirrors are about how we can see ourselves in them as others have seen themselves in them. So um, I'm very flattered that you uh, chose it for the cover. Yeah. yeah. There's so many talented artists and I feel very honored. As well as the artists who inspired me, such as Brian Freeman and Paul participants from New York, a young playwright, wrote uh, two very short plays in response to her outlook. And so I invited Brian to actually perform one of those plays, which he did at the second second event in, in November. Yes, and he, it was... With, with a little mini troupe. He brought a troupe, he brought costumes, he brought... And, and Brian is not new to performance. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so you, had, you kind of had a unique role um, that was different than... Yeah, and I'm, and I'm one of the authors from the original mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> edition of the uh, album, which is here. Yeah. Yeah. published. Yeah. Well, that's how we snuck around my rule. I had a rule that the, none of the participants were going to be people who had been involved in Outlook. You know, I really wanted to do like an intergenerational Thing. So Brian sort of slipped through the cracks by this special role. Perform the work that, by that, exactly. A younger. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So at the second, uh, thank you. At the second performance in November, we did a very ten-minute performance that was really fun and that people really responded to. So I'm going to recoup that performance now. Um, it's 10 minutes. Can you hold this? I have to get my props. Um, this is a semi-participant. And I'll get the people who 
wanted to stand uh, together. And then we oh, okay. <laughs> I'll explain who else uh, <laughs> did. Publication is for closet heteros. Homosexuality is the same sex orientation. It is not about men or women together. We have nothing to offer men who are oriented in men physically and emotionally for gay male separatism. Mm -hmm. WJ 330, 1990. If gay men want Tom of Finland in their magazines, and put it in men's magazines. <laughs> Calling Outlook a lesbian and gay quarterly and feeding the stereotype of gay men's massive penises as their only vital organ is offensive. <laughs> How do articles on lesbian softball and lesbian aging offer any <laughs> <laughs> Grand Forks, North Dakota, winter, 1989. <laughs> Some of Finland focuses on masculinity as the ultimate value, which is in and of itself fascist. <laughs> Honestly, how many of us had an adolescence that would parallel those of Tom's characters? Most of us took drama, choir, dance, art, and got beat up in locker rooms. When we got older, we tried to change and become like Tom's cartoon characters. <laughs> Seattle, Washington, winter. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we were a little squeamish about the Tom of Finland stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the 1998 issue. But in these times of learning to eroticize safe sex, an article on men's erotica is extremely relevant. If that jerk-off picture helps save someone's life, isn't it socially valuable? <laughs> the sex and politics are never easy issues. <clears throat> we hope you'll continue to publish articles that deal with compelling and not necessarily easy issues. And even though we're dykes, we don't want to shut our eyes to what's going on in the men's community. We really are in this mess together. Let's consent to keep one another informed. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Austin, Texas, fall of 1989. When I first saw the cover text, when lesbians fall for men, I almost dropped the magazine like a hot potato. <laughs> I looked around guilty to be sure no one had seen me juxtaposed with this magazine cover because it was obviously designed with me in mind. <laughs> I too am a lesbian coping with back backsliding into the arms of a man. I've never felt so alone. This is so much more difficult than coming out as a lesbian ever was for me. Washington, D.C., spring 1990. <laughs> Lesbians are moving beyond the realm of sisterhood into the world of the nasty, the tasty, and the sexy. We dance and sweat and tease, and we, in all capital letters, have sex. It should come as no surprise that this lesbian community, with its rapidly expanding parameters, should come up against such difficult and painful questions. What do you do when a rock woman starts sleeping with boys and are loving it? <laughs> it is not simply that we finally are able to voice certain questions about desire, that the self-righteous atmosphere of political rectitude and erotophobia we call lesbian feminism kept us from uttering. Our new culture is actually producing new desires, and the questions follow naturally. Brooklyn, New York, Spring, 1998. Jim Clausen can rationalize her interest in condition until she's blue in the cup. The politics of the patriarchy, the penis, and the pussy have been used here as a poor excuse, a scapegoat, and a vaginal veil for her failures as a woman identified woman. Hopefully, one day, she'll find that the real truth resides deep down inside the vaginal walls, the walls that for centuries have ached and cried for freedom, the real freedom, the only. <laughs> Sacramento, California, spring, 1990. The house that Brenda built left me irritated and slightly puzzled as to the use of the pronoun she. This article is about a boarding house for male transvestites in Brazil. Transvestites that they may be, they are men. Cross-dressing in women's clothes, and taking on women's names does not belong to me. I fully support men who want to wear dresses, skirts, and jewelry, and consider it a bold political action in this society that so enforces men's macho moments, roles, and so despises women. But I am offended when drag queens, transvestites, or gay men refer to themselves or other men as she. To me, it's akin to a white American wearing cornrows and dashiki and calling themselves African. Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, summer. Number 10. Uh, yeah. Right now? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Number 10. Party line politics are a major snore, and I'm glad Outlook is willing to publish controversial articles, but did you really have to feature both when lesbians fall for men and sexual lies a butch fesses up on the cover of the winter issue? If I were a just coming out teenage girl who happened to pick up that particular issue, I'd walk away thinking that the major lesbian issues, issue is penises. The main variation among us being whether we secretly want them in us or on us. <laughs> Which sounds suspiciously like the pre-liberation party line we all grew up with. New York, summer 1990. <laughs> Your publication is an absolute embarrassment to the gay community. When I read about the lesbians who love to wear false testicles and penises and who constantly dreamt about having intercourse with men, I knew that these people were sick. <laughs> My lover and I act and look like two women. I enjoy being and acting like a woman. Gay people today are looking better and better. Don't set us back to the pre-1920s era. New York, New York, fall 1980. If a lesbian couple wants to act and look like two women, great. But please, don't push your standards on me. Do they really expect me to believe like I have to act and look like society's stereotypical norm of what a woman should look and act like? That norm typically refers to the preconceived notions for straight women, not gender-bending dykes like myself. Oceanside, California, spring 1991. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, I remember that I wanted to sort of uh, 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 interview 
interviewed people who responded to the book and participated that I forgot about. Um, so, um, Jackie and Alicia, I'll start with you. And who else? Um, Julian. So, um, Tell me, like, okay, I approached you and asked you if you wanted to participate in this. I'm curious how your initial impression of what this would be compares to what it turned out to be for you, the process. I can start with the process, actually. <laughs> I had no idea it would be in color. Somehow I didn't notice for all those months that I was reading the magazine again and thinking about it and drawing it and writing it. Everything I was doing was in black and white. And it was so surprising to discover that the queer past existed in color when I walked in here. I will miss this wall so much. It's so beautiful. Um, I think I kind of initially was excited, but then kind of panicked that it was going to have to be um, I'm not necessarily a visual artist, so thinking about like how can I like, I knew what I wanted to write about, but how can I make this a, vis a visible, physical, visual sort of um, thing? And then finally realizing that the reason I was chosen was for what I can do, which is, which is right. Um, and so that was, there was a big difference between like what I initially thought I was going to put out, which I wasn't super confident in, and then what I actually was able to produce, which I feel far more of a kinship with now. Yeah, um, as I said, uh, initially I think that E.G. approached me as a writer, and um, I'm obviously a writer and a reader, but there was something that was very, I don't know, um, material about touching the actual book and just thinking about it being part of an archive and you know the desire for archives is a lot of us has thought about and the absence of archives or the silence of the archives and I just wanted to make a thing. I wanted to put an object, another object in the world. So I didn't expect to. That was actually exciting to me because I, I said to people, even though I created obsessive lists of how many writers, how many poets, how many you know, graphic artists. Um, I said to people in the medium of your choice, and I actually found it exciting that you, you and several other people um, worked in a medium that wasn't your usual. And I, I like that you moved outside your comfort zone. Good. That, no, that was a goal of the project. Anybody else have thoughts or comments about how they want to say? something to uh, the great tapestry of queer history and queer art and my particular work had space for a lot of audience participation we wanted people to interact with an exhibition leave their mark on the wall like we do on Facebook every day as they did in this exhibition where people were literally writing on the wall to respond to the art 
Um, so it's just a great honor, and it's revealed so much about uh, just amazing steps we've taken in the LGBT society to have an exhibition like this today. Thank you. Hey, my, my name is Brad. I'm here at the GLBT Museum, checking out the Outlook exhibit. Uh, before tonight, I had no idea about the history of Outlook magazine, and I'm finding that it's stylish as hell, full of fascinating content. Uh, the, the, the various fights of the queer community are alive on its pages, and uh, I'm learning my history here. Hi, my name is John, and I'm talking about Outlook and this show at the GLBT Center. Um, I remember when Outlook came around, I had just moved to San Francisco uh, in 89. And I remember it was kind of a big deal. Um, I also remember it was an expensive magazine and that I don't think I ever bought one, but I used to see them around and I would read them. And it was different for being more intellectual and in depth than other magazines. And uh, it had a really good design sense and photography as well as articles. So it's nice to see this show because I hadn't really thought about it for a long time. And there's one of the, um, they've got covers of the magazines on the wall. One of the magazine covers shows a, a, a ad that I think was on, um, it was either on billboards or it was on buses in San Francisco of two boys kissing. And that was controversial back in 90 or 91, whenever that was. And um, it's nice to see again. And it reminded me of that by seeing the show. So I'm glad I came. Well, I've, I've seen the uh, exhibit before, the exhibits here, because there's multiple exhibits. And uh, this particular one is, this is a closing um, event for it. And I also, and it was highlighting a publication called Outlook. And so it's just interesting as part of uh, our gay history, or I should say LGBTQ XYZ <laughs> history. So I am heading off now. <laughs>